Hi, Smart Community friends. Welcome back to the summer series here on the Smart Community Podcast. As you know, we're taking a little break from new content over the Australian summer holidays, and instead we're sharing the replays of a few of our all-time favourite episodes. This week, we're sharing my conversation with Raymond Sun and Susanna Wilkinson from episode 276, which was released in February of 2022. Ray is a solicitor at Herbert Smith Freehills, specialising in technology, media and telecommunications and privacy law. Susanna is the Digital Law Lead Australia and Asia at the same firm, leading the development of smart legal contracts and the provision of digital law solutions in conjunction with the development of the Australian national blockchain. We start off the conversation by talking about Ray and Susanna's backgrounds in law and their current work looking at how laws are able to adapt to the new issues of emerging technology. Ray then tells us about his passion for technology and artificial intelligence and Susanna, her passion for improving digitised processes and how that involves the law. We then talk about what a smart community means to them. We then discuss the importance of data in smart communities, the increased use of data and the risks associated, and therefore the importance of having legal frameworks in place. We then discuss how data leads to smart communities and emerging technologies. Ray and Susanna then share with us a bit about some of the projects they were working on at the time of recording, and we finish our chat discussing several emerging trends, including lawyers' roles in smart communities and forward-looking legislation, digital twin representation and accountability in the real world, more flexibility and adaptable infrastructure projects, shifts in privacy law, and finally, digital identity. We will be sure to get Ray and Susanna back on the show in the future for a full update about what they've been up to since we recorded this episode and how our thinking has progressed since this conversation. But in the meantime, as always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns and smart cities. It's where we live, work and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Ray, and hello, Susanna. Welcome to the Smart Community Podcast. I'm so excited to have you both here. Hi, Zoe. Thanks for having us. Hey, Zoe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm really excited to have this conversation. So let's just jump straight in and we'll start with you, Susanna. Can you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about? Sure. So I am a lawyer, first and foremost. I have a background in infrastructure project, renewable energy, automation, and uh, digital law. So that's a really big mixed bag. I've often joked that, you know, the day that I find myself driving around in a fully autonomous vehicle with a battery pack connected to the grid as part of the virtual, you know, the virtual grid, I will be happy. But yes, so I'm the co-head of the Global Digital Law Group at Herbert Smith Freehills based in Brisbane. And I have the privilege of working with a team of super smart lawyers who get to play at the intersection of law and technology. So that's looking at how our laws are able to adapt to the new issues and um, whether that's legal, ethical, regulatory of emerging tech. Amazing. And Ray, how about you? Yeah, so I'm a solicitor at the same firm as with Susanna. I'm based in the Sydney office and I'm a solicitor in the technology, media, and telecommunications practice. I'm also a member of the digital law group. And my passion has always been technology. Since I was a kid, I love building tech, looking at tech, reading about tech. And personally, I love AI. I, I like to build AI products, AI tools, and I like to just teach people about AI. And um, yeah, recently I've been, you know, have gone into the the lead of the AI and data role at the DLG, so at the digital law group. So really happy to be here and just talk about smart cities and how it changes our lives. Awesome. Now, Susanna, what's your passion? I know I heard some tech stuff in there. What's your what's your passion? I think I could probably explain it. I'm going to answer that question again. Zoe, I'm passionate about doing things better. 
So I'm passionate about, as a lawyer, I look at the way that we deliver our products and services, and I see them as being really disconnected from the digital processes that our clients are implementing on the ground. I look at contracts and I think, my goodness, why isn't my contract speaking to the data sources that that the process is already speaking to? And that sort of led us down a rabbit hole of exploring smart legal contracts, which is how do you embed automation into a contract? So we've got lots of automation going on in the world already, but bringing the relevance of law to those digitized processes, I think is probably where I'm really passionate about. And that comes from a holistic look at how do we, yeah, how do we improve processes? How do we add value to the universe in what we're doing rather than just sticking with what's been done before? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Now, okay, we'll start with you, Ray. What is a smart city or what I like to call a smart community to you? Yeah, so just in short, I think smart city is digital transformation on an urban scale. So right now, what we're seeing in the market is that a lot of especially big companies looking towards cutting down costs and improving efficiencies and generating more value from the source that they have. And they're really into, they're looking into emerging tech like AI, um, distributed ledger technologies, or crypto or metaverse um, things to help really speed up and improve the business processes. But most of this digital transformation at the, at the company level is mainly you know, for profit so, oh, and also to some extent social change. So when we talk about smart cities, we're talking about similar adoption of tech, but it's also taken up at the government level for the benefit of like the whole community and for the whole city. So I see it as more of a, an uplift and improvement of a city as a whole using technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like that definition because it really, it is different to, like you said, we can use technologies to improve our profits and, on, and efficiencies and all those type of things as well. And, and some of that stuff definitely falls into this space, you know, improving efficiencies, but bringing it back to the community and how people benefit is really what, you know, a lot of the conversations well, actually, all of the conversations come back to uh, people that I talk on the podcast from so many different angles. So no, thanks for sharing that. Susanna, how about you? What is a smart city or a smart community to you? Yeah, look, I absolutely agree with what Ray said. And I probably would just add that, you know, when we talk about digital transformation at a corporate level, what we're really talking about is the collection of data to improve, you know, through data analytics that can create value, either through new sources of value or through doing things better. And there's a really simple example, you know, whereas we used to have a toothbrush and then we had an electric toothbrush and then we had a smart electric toothbrush where that toothbrush is sending information off to, you know, through a little sensor and I have an app and I could, I don't actually have this, but I know it exists where you can brush your teeth and you can watch on the app whether you're doing a good job. You know, what's really interesting is looking at that use of data for either better decision making or new sources of value. And when we take that to the urban level, and we start to overlay not just different silos of information or data sources, but the additional complexity that we have in urban environments where we've got utility providers, we've got human movement, we've got interaction between people, between governments, between businesses and governments, overlaying all of those complex interactions and finding better ways for those interactions to take place that generate a social net benefit. And I think that's really interesting. And we can look at very specific examples of that, but you can also look at it at a really holistic level. And that I think is where the ultimate value is. Yeah, absolutely. I think the more we can make decisions or be aware of the data that could be available or even is available right now, but until you're aware of it and can look at it and and think about the insights you could get out of it, you you can't make decisions that are based on it, which sounds fairly obvious, but I think like it sometimes is a bit, you know, oh, we've got all this data, what's all happening? But until you actually look at it and what what it is and what it isn't. And I think there's another really important point there, Zoe, which is it's really new, relatively new in humankind to have access to all of this information, to have all of this data. And actually, in many cases, we're creating vast amounts of data, but it's not useful. It's not structured, clean data sets that we can necessarily apply. So there's a kind of ground up thinking that needs to be applied here, which is, okay, what is the information we're trying to source? How will we use that information when we have it? And what's the benefit that we're looking to achieve? And there's some great examples of unexpected consequences of overlaying different data sets 
is one example I remember reading about, which was about how ambulance drivers had take, took their coffee breaks and actually trying to improve the public benefit outcome of having ambulance drivers sequence their, their breaks so that they were you know, avoiding traffic jams and all these sorts of things. So heaps of those examples. But what's really interesting from a lawyer's perspective is that increased use of data, and we perhaps can come on to this in a moment, but we're tracking human behaviour ultimately is what we're doing in a lot of this data use. So there's human behaviour and there's interactions. That data's being collected through IoT devices. A lot of it's coming from smartphones, it's coming from cars. How do we think about the uses of that data and how do we make sure that our various legislative frameworks are adapting to think about the way that those data sets will be used in the future. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think that's such a, a, an important point and one of you know, a huge reason why I wanted to get you both on the podcast because there is so much change happening. And like you said, and I really like the way, and it's something I hadn't really thought about before really, or just not in that way, that having this amount of data is is new, which is you know fairly obvious, but actually it means that we don't, really know what to do with it we're all coming up with these new ways to use it to benefit from it etc etc and so it's not like anybody could have can even if you're looking at data if you've been an analyst for you know 20 years the new types are are always rapidly changing and things are coming on on to play so you you think we're still trying to be experts in it right like we're still trying to keep oh, oh but we could do this and this and this so we're all still learning along the way as well which it's interesting, and I think from a legal perspective, is like a, a huge um, what's the word? I guess a risk in use and all that type of stuff. So yeah, and I, I don't want to I don't want to be sort of too negative. I think there are definitely opportunities for this, but if we just pick up on that, that sort of overly simplistic toothbrush example for a second, you know, how do we deal with the granting of consent to use that information? I might be really happy to give the toothbrush man toothbrush manufacturer access to how often and how well I brush my teeth. So what happens when either that data set gets sold or an insurance company buys through an M&A transaction, buys the manufacturer and starts to piece together those two data sets based on, you know, my ability to claim health insurance over dental with how often and how well I brush my teeth. So those, that kind of the pooling and the, the aggregation of data sets becomes a really interesting piece. Now, that's slightly different when you're talking about human flows of you know, human movement in an infrastructure sense. Okay, so how I drive and how long I take to get from A to B and whether there are ways that we can improve traffic flows through smarter use of, you know, traffic lights and those sorts of things. There's obviously benefits there, but it's interesting when we start to think about how are we collecting that information, what's it going to be used for, and not just what's it going to be used for today or in three years' time, but as we start to feed all of this information into massive machine learning algorithms and into AI, to the extent that there's issues in those data sets, then those issues can be magnified. But I don't want to go too down, too much down the AI rabbit hole just yet, but it's a really interesting perspective from a lawyer's frame of mind. It is, and I see you nodding along, Ray, so we're going to come to you um, in a sec. But I just wanted to add, I think that's a really uh, good point because, and a lot of what we talk about in the smart community space is making sure that we can have answers to those things, particularly when you know we're government agencies or um, you know we're protecting the people, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess also it's that's why it's so important that the legal frameworks are up to speed with the rapid change of technology because we want to make sure that 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 can't happen. Like for you know the COVID app, for example, that data can only be used for certain purposes and then not later on after we've all gone. Yes, we're fine with people tracking our movements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for this purpose. But yeah, yeah, I think there's also we need to be honest. We need to be brutally honest. You know, we get nervous about the the COVID app tracking our movements, but we're giving away so much more information through using our smartphones every day anyway. So, <laughs> and then one other quick point I just want to make as well, which is the complexity of managing all of this data. Technology has to be a part of that solution. You know, there are some great concepts around applications of distributed ledger technology for self-sovereign identity that's going to really help in how we manage control of our own personal information. But anyway, Ray, please jump in. I'm sure you've got lots of things to add. Yeah, yeah. Just, I completely agree with what Susanna said. Um, just to put some new perspective onto this discussion, I see smart cities as being one of the applications of data. So instead, so to think of the other way around, instead of thinking about how smart cities lead to data, we can think about how data is what leads to smart cities. 
it's analogous to the discovery of oil. When oil was discovered, it created a whole new industry, automobile industry, vehicle industry, a bunch of new industries. It's likewise, the data as a commodity is giving rise to a whole new world and smart city is just one part of that new picture. But the difference between oil and data, in addition to one being physical and one being intangible, oil it's just one state. It's you, you only have certain chemical compounds that create that oil. So you have you have a limited range of applications. But when it comes to data, because it's intangible, it's digital, it can change like within months or years, it can change form. And it's really challenging for regulators to just keep up with that. And it's really important to be able to be forward looking and develop rules and regulations that can accommodate for any change in the data. And the thing about data is that it's unlimited. So oil, there's a lot of oil, but it's ultimately limited on this earth. But data, there's new data every day. It's like the universe is forever expanding. And so it's also a challenge for technologists is as data keeps increasing, increasing, you have a lot of good data, but it's also a lot of bad data. And this, it's, just, it's, it's also a challenge for technologists to be able to differentiate what is good data, what is bad data, how to maximize value from the data. And these are the questions that can then be translated into the smart city context. So I like to see as Dala as the root source of everything and smart cities just being one of the applications of, or one of the manifestations of proper use of Dala. Mm, I really love that perspective and I hadn't really thought about it in that way. So thanks for flipping that because I think that's really, really important and really, really true. And I think if we start thinking about it like that and using Dala as that foundation, and then, yeah, looking at the different applications that sit on top of that. So, no, really, really good. Yeah, because many emerging technologies are based on data now. So, for example, artificial intelligence, right? It's really cool. But what makes artificial intelligence make its predictions and do all this cool stuff is just based on the data itself. Distributed technology, having the whole blockchain system. Well, the key appeal of having blockchain is just because it records transaction data in an immutable form. So again, the fundamental thing about it is just data. NFTs, metaverse, all of them are just ways of creating value out of data. So that's why I feel like data is the real true source of everything and everything else is just an application of it. Yeah, so I think it's that it's a combination or the, the intersection of those various trends of data automation and you know IoT sensors collecting that data, being connected to something else. And this is a lot of the work we're doing with smart legal contracts, which is you imagine a contract, maybe it's on a mine site, and you can start to use the IoT sensors on that site to collect information about when certain activities have been completed. You've got, you know, the standard example of a, a truck over a Weybridge sensor that's triggering an event under a contract, or maybe you've got you know, commodity prices tipping that change the amount of ore that you're seeking to mine, and you're linking up, you know, the number of personnel on site based to the orders of equipment that you're buying in for clothing and you know, you can start to automate so many of those processes. And then back to Ray's point, what we think is really cool is when you start to automate those processes, you're creating a digital record of what's going on in that business relationship. So you're starting to create that digital audit trail or a digital twin of a business relationship. And that starts to offer lots more opportunities. So again, coming back to the urban environment, you know, sitting up on level 30 of my office building, looking out the window, I have these visions of a hive mind. You know, there's this central brain that's feeding on all this data, that's making sensible and accurate decisions for how to best run that hive mind community. When we start to connect and automate a lot of those interactions, we can start to map the economy in a way that you could sort of map the ocean floor and the currents using particular technologies. And in my mind, it's a living, breathing, pulsing kind of ecosystem that's really harnessing those, those specific technologies. Yeah. And actually, just going back to the first question, what is a smart city? And I would put to define a smart city is simply just a data ecosystem. Yeah. Simple, right? Okay. I'm keen to talk about, we've already started talking about some of the projects and things that you've been working on, or you've alluded to some of the topics and the clients, what they're asking of you. So I'm keen to dive into some of those that you can share with us. So maybe Ray, do you want to give us some examples of your most, well, it doesn't have to be most exciting or your favorite project, whatever project you want to tell us about. 
Yeah, so Herbert Smith Freehill is is really actively involved in helping guide government and human rights policy on like you know on various tech policies and、um, regulations. So one big piece of work that we did was partaking in the Australian Human Rights Commission's、um, technology experiment, where they were thinking about ways, well, basically exploring the issues around algorithmic bias. For those who don't know, algorithmic bias refers to the use of artificial intelligence or other decision-making tools to make real, like, important decisions in our society. And the issue of algorithmic bias is that because AI is dependent on the data that it intakes, if the data itself has a problem, then that will infect the AI. So basically, in other words, garbage in, garbage out. So that's a real issue, and especially in When algorithms are used in the court system, predictive justice—that's called,、uh, where you rely on previous criminal record data to predict the outcome of a present case—and certain groups of people are overrepresented in that data, which could then lead to systematic discrimination of that certain group of people in the court system. Anyway, that's just basically what algorithmic bias is. And Herbert Smith Freehills was involved in like advising like what are issues around that. And some recommendations to address that. And not long ago, the Human Rights Commission released a report about the recommendations. And there were some very useful recommendations, which I think will be really relevant to smart cities, especially since when smart cities will start to really adopt artificial intelligence to make like administrative decisions or commercial decisions. And there are various new types of human rights we've never heard of. For example, the issue around liability. So for a long time, we've been debating when a code goes wrong, who's to blame? Is it the user of the code? Is it the developer of the code? An intermediary in between? So the report likes to put or、well, is proposing that we should put an onus on the corporation who is using the artificial intelligence to make a decision. So subject to any rebuttable evidence, the corporation that is using applying artificial intelligence to make decisions should be liable for it to some extent. Another another interesting individual. There's also better individual protection. So if an individual is affected by a decision of an AI, they have certain rights. For example, rights to know what were the reasons behind it and stuff like that. So there are a bunch of like cool individual rights that better protect people from algorithmic bias. So it's highly recommended that um look, maybe we could send a link after this to the report for people to look at. But yeah, it's very the report itself. It also represents. A new way of thinking, a new way of like not taking technology too lightly, but also thinking seriously, because we are now at the stage where technology is not just a gimmick or just a fad. It actually can impact real people's lives, and that's where we have to really think seriously about the legal issues around it. Yeah, I think it's so important, and, and something I've been thinking about and doing a bit about. I'm doing a master's of data science, and something I've been thinking about a lot is this bias. But even in just Fairly simple things like me as the person that's coding. I'm doing asset management stuff. I can make a decision in my like t- statistical analysis that favors a certain thing this way or that way. Now, when it's a pothole or a crack on a road or asset, maybe it doesn't matter too too much. But actually, where's all of the yeah the, the quality behind that? And obviously, you know, we have all these other things in place. I'm an engineer, so used to standards and all those type of things. And just diving into that, I found really, really interesting as well. Then you talk about algorithms making decisions about people's, you know, whether they get something or they don't, or what level they get. There's so much in that too. So、uh, that sounds like a really, really interesting report, and I will put the link in the show notes、uh, so people can find that. Zoe, to, to your point there, I think what is really interesting is again bringing a lawyer's mindset to this. The law has evolved to allocate. Risk or obligations to the party best able to manage that risk, and when we have human decision makers, arguably their brain is somewhat of a black box. <laughs> we don't always know what goes into the decision making, but we have laws around, you know, administrative law that gives us the right to appeal or it gives us the right to challenge those questions or to know the reasons for that decision. So there are really robust legal concepts that can be applied to technology. We don't always need wholesale new laws for these things. We just need to think about, through particular legislative, you know, or for through legal principles, or in this case, the, the project that we were talking about took a real life data set and applied human rights principles to the application of that data set. So, 
they are definitely interesting issues and really important issues. So I think what's really interesting is looking at how we're using data today, how the decision-making process works, but really having an eye to the future, making sure that we've got robust policies and legal principles that can adapt and have longevity so that they can see what's coming and accommodate what's coming will be really important. Yeah, because you need the framework in place before the technology hits it, right? That's right. And in, in many cases, we have those frameworks. You know, what's going on at the moment in the regulation of crypto assets is a classic example. You know, we have frameworks that are there to design to protect against the harms that we have in financial markets, you know, to protect consumers from putting their money into a scam. We need to be able to just apply those same principles to the new technologies that create the same kinds of risks. And in some cases, it's not always a one-to-one mapping exercise. In some cases, we do need to think differently. But the law's been around for a really long time. <laughs> in many cases, it's, it's relatively robust. You know, the, the UK Law Commission just released their report yesterday saying that smart legal contracts are, are valid under the laws of England and Wales. And that's another example but, I, you know, your audience won't all be lawyers, so I won't bore them too much with that. <laughs> well, I nearly was became a lawyer. I did my engineering degree and I did one subject of environmental law and I nearly switched, but I didn't. But, you know, there's still, there's still lots of life to live. Who knows? That's right. So did you want to share any projects, uh, Susanna, or we can talk about the future trends, which I know you're super keen to talk about? Yeah, look, I look, there's probably some themes in projects. Can't really talk too specifically about many, but we're seeing what I think is really interesting at a thematic level is that we're seeing traditional corporates now really start to take the chance and dip their toe in the water with digital assets. So some companies that you wouldn't necessarily think of launching into new markets through non-fungible tokens, or we're looking at some, some investment houses investing in gaming companies and being issued with utility tokens off the back of that. So, and certainly we're seeing a rebranding of many of the big companies as technology companies. So where you might have had an infrastructure operator or manager, you know, I'd say over the last five years, they've, they've been saying, well, we're no longer in the core business of whatever we used to say we're doing, but we are now a technology company. The banks are technology companies. And I think that's indicative of some of the things we've already talked about on this podcast that it is all about new sources of value and most of that's coming from data. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let us zoom to the future now. And Ray, we'll start with you. What are the emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough? Mm, I think this, what I'm going to say, is basically going to encapsulate what Suzanne and I have been talking about for the past 20 minutes or so. And it's smart cities, it's not just a matter of slapping on new tech onto a building or putting AI onto a road. It's not just the physical tech component. And what I think people, many people overlook is the legal basis behind it. So often many people who don't know too much about smart cities can't really connect the role of the lawyer with a smart city. So I feel like one key trend will be the role of the lawyer, how it's going to change within the smart city context. And so in the future, as smart cities become more prominent and emerge out of the ground, lawyers will need to really think not just the traditional legal principles, but really think about how how new technology affects the way we apply these principles. And that goes all the way back to Susanna's point around there needs to be forward-looking regulation and rules in order for a smart city to to thrive. Without that sort of forward-looking legislation, then you can run into many issues and there could be a lot of harm and hurt to our society. And so that's where lawyers become increasingly important, really helping government form regulations that are forward-looking. And when I say forward-looking in practical terms, that means like forming principle-based rules, technology agnostic, rules that can last for a long time and still be relevant even after like a few centuries or so. And especially like, for example, privacy. Privacy is going to be a really big, hot issue and like trend that you could say as data becomes more and more prevalent. Right now we have privacy laws and legislations, but they've been revised and redrafted and re-amended on a piecemeal basis, mainly so like, for example, an, a complaint arose or a matter arose, and then the government has reacted to that case by amending certain clauses of the privacy, and that's it. It's like a band-aid approach. That's okay for now, but once smart cities become really big, we're going to really have to rethink 
the concept of privacy protection regulation. And it all goes back down to the fundamental principle. So the fundamental principle is why do we have privacy protection? Why do we need to protect privacy in the first place? And we really have to focus on the individual because it's the individual privacy who's at stake here. And that basically involves a whole reshift, a whole new discussion around risk allocation, which was Susanna talked about again, thinking about hmm, maybe maybe the risk should be placed on another party or another body when it comes to price protection. These are really big questions that like, I don't have the answers right now, but that, that's a, definitely a big question or like a trend that will become very big and in the headlines in the next few years or decades. Yeah, and I might just add there, Ray, I think that's absolutely right. When we start to think about the increasing number of touch points that we will have as individuals with digital systems, whether they're you know, by our own opt-in or whether we're just being, you know, tracked through our movements and so on, that digital footprint that we create becomes our digital twin. So we will have individual digital twins. We're working really hard to have digital twins of cities and and all of these concepts so that we can use that information. How we as a society choose to allocate rights to use or protect that information is going to be really important. And I think there's another general theme so that, that digital twin piece is, is massive because it, it touches everything. And if there is, if almost everything in the real world has a digital twin representation, then, you know, some basic concepts of law is my actions in the digital realm, are they the same as my actions in the real world? And can I be punished if I'm doing certain things in the metaverse? Can I be punished <laughs> in the real world? Or should I? Is my digital twin the same thing as me? But that's some big, some big challenging legal concepts. I think another thing that's really interesting is looking at from a government and policy perspective in an infrastructure sense, decisions that we're making now need to be based on the technologies of the future. So we've seen in the last couple of years in Australia some infrastructure projects that I think have probably been on the books for a very long time, you know, without naming any particular infrastructure projects, but I wonder whether we could have made decisions to spend taxpayers' money in a different way if we had perhaps freed ourselves of what we've done in the past, you know, maybe it's building a tram isn't the best way to build infrastructure going forward. Maybe we need to look at different, more flexible and adaptable infrastructure projects. And that's a lot of bringing new ideas to light. It's a lot of bringing multidisciplinary teams into these conversations and, and having some courage to, to make decisions based on where we are today and where we want to be in the future, not necessarily what we've had on the books or what's been in an infrastructure plan for a really long time. Yeah, and just to kind of like also hone in on that point, just to also put it to perspective for listeners out there, the whole thing about, you know, privacy regulation and making sure that there is forward-looking regulation, an analogy could be consumer protection. So a few decades ago, um, we saw the rise of the middle class. People started earning income. They can start buying more good luxury goods for themselves. And previously, Consumer protection was really just limited to our contractual law principles, mainly in the, also the principle of caveat on top, which means like, oh, let the buyer be aware. Basically, all the risk, most of the risk is on the buyer. If you bought something faulty or that's not good, then it's pretty much on you to bear the, to bear the risk, bear the loss. And there are some obligations on the seller, but the balance of risk was a lot onto the consumer. But as the middle class expanded, people started buying more things. We start to saw, uh, see a rise in these consumer complaints, and it was like up to the 1970s where governments started thinking we can't just rely on people going to court, going to tribunals to like argue their consumer case. We have to find, we have to introduce a new type of system, a whole relift, a whole revamp, and that's where the Trade Practice Act of 1974 came in, and that has then evolved into our favorite. Australian consumer law. So I think that sort of analogy, that's proof and tested analogy. And we're going to probably see something similar like that in terms of privacy. Right now we have a Privacy Act in Australia, but that still, as I said, it, it has a very piecemeal approach. Whether issue arises, it will be fixed in relation to that issue. Maybe within the next few decades or so, there's going to be a big shift in how we look at privacy. Again, I'm not sure how that will look like, but that's another big thing that we're going to look at. And also, I know we've talked a lot about privacy and not like, it seems like it might be off topic of smart cities, but I just want to reassure the listeners that smart cities is data and data is smart cities. So really 
these two are really interconnected. And if we can work out all our data issues, then we're able to solve many of our future smart city issues. So I feel that's like the real crux of the of our talk. Yeah. And Ray, so I think going Zoe, also to one of your questions, you know, what do we think people aren't talking about? I think digital identity as a concept is a really interesting one. You know, it's the cornerstone of a digital economy, which is effectively smart cities. So looking at ways of enabling a digital identity system that's broad enough to safely unlock the benefits of digital economy, but also protecting rights and freedoms will be really interesting. And we, I think those conversations are really early stages in terms of where we think they need to end up. But talking about some of the more novel and interesting things, you know, stepping back from the cities, we're now seeing a race to a space race. You know, we're now looking at new parts of our world that people are pushing into. We're looking at people advertising in space, moving away from billboards on the side of a highway and looking at projecting, you know, bat signal style messages up into space that everyone can see. You know, how do we as a society decide where to draw the line? And, and some of my colleagues and I love to talk about the idea of having you know, a digital free national park in the same way that we preserve certain spaces for nature and biodiversity, but also the ability to switch off. <laughs> you know, it's great that we have these centralised control systems and, and that we have all of this digital connectivity, but actually to be able to disconnect will be really, really important as well for us as humans. Yeah, I totally agree. It'll be, yeah, it's a luxury, right? If we were able to turn off, which it will, that's what we'll get to. And talk about smart cities a lot in the community aspect of being able to buy back our leisure time. Like not that we can just continue to be more and more productive because we know that we're still humans at the end of the day. So we're going to burn out eventually if we can just use technology to be more and more productive all the time, beyond all the time. Once we get to a point where it's acceptable that we're actually buying back leisure time, you know, we're not, things are taking less time, they're more efficient. So we don't have to work as much. Yeah. That's really interesting. I wonder how if we do buy back our leisure time, will we disconnect or will we just spend more time on Instagram and social media? And, you know, are we actually, what does that really look like? Because even though we're not working, when we're engaged with social media, we are making money for someone, you know, <laughs> it's just not us. <laughs> yeah. So it's also that there's also the cultural element of the smart cities that will also change. Like it's going to be a a trend in like culture will change and how people will live their day-to-day lives. So that's also a big one. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting though. I mean, you know, five years ago we were looking, we we're talking about predictions of connected and autonomous vehicles, you know, how it was going to revolutionize the the use of urban spaces and all of these sorts of things. And I remember reading in the in the commentary at the time, you know, on one hand people would say, oh, it's going to be wonderful because people will work on the you know, they'll work on their commute. And then on the other hand, they would say, Oh, but it doesn't take into account the fact that people get car sick when they're reading or on a laptop in a car. And so there were two arguments for every side of the story. Some people said there would be more congestion. Some people said there would be less congestion. So I think there's still a long way for us to go in exploring how these things will will play out and what the real benefits will be. But we've we've got an opportunity to shape that as well. So I, you know, get involved with these conversations and and speak up about what we want the urban environments to be and how we want this to be to play out I think is really important yeah it's so true like get involved and shape it because we need all the voices and we need all the perspectives we need your all your professional backgrounds because we all have something to add to this which is why I started the podcast right I wanted more people to learn more people to get involved and I wanted more people to kind of go take you know people will listen to this episode some people will take a hundred things from this someone will take one thing and that's great but then if we can think about things a bit differently and then go, oh, well, you know, maybe you're, you're not a lawyer, but now you've learned a little bit about that. You're a planner. Um, so, oh, I wonder how I could import this or, or whatever the case is. What else could add to this conversation? So I think it's really important and I think will continue to be. The term smart city, uh, it's a bit of, it was a bit of a buzz term. It's kind of gone up and down in the cycle, but the actual concept behind it has not disappeared. It's morphed and changed and become more mature, more about people and the things we can do to really serve the community. And then we're now having better conversations about things like privacy. We're not just taking for granted that the technology is going to protect us or the technology companies are going to protect us because we know that that's not the case. And then the traditional players, like you talked about, we're going to see more and more in people in this space because they have to be, because this is, you know, technology, like um, Ray, you said earlier, technology is not going away. It's not this 
fun thing that we, that a robot thing, the TIA, like there's so many things that we rely on every single day. I think that's right. And the other thing is it's easy to focus on the technology and get really swept up in the hype and all the opportunities, but ultimately we are people. And what we're talking about is how we interact. And we use the term smart cities to kind of label this thing as if it's something new and something different, but ultimately it's just another way of, it's an evolution of the way that we as humans interact and connect in a particular space. And the metaverse is an exa- is another example of that. I mean, the metaverse is just another term for how we're going to interact as humans. But people think of it like a place <laughs> that you can go and buy land in the metaverse, but it is really just a different way of, of connecting and, and interacting. So but it's funny how we, we as humans put labels on things that um, try and draw analogies. That's a really interesting point because I know early in the podcast, I talked about like smart cities being like digital transformation on urban scale and being a data network. But just expand on Susanna's point. There's also an alternative way of looking at smart cities as a relative concept. If you took someone from the 1890s and they, you propelled them forward in time, they'll think our suburbs, just a normal suburb, would be a smart city. They see, wow, all the waterways are connected, everything's connected. Wow, that's a smart city to them. So it's also, I feel like it could be also seen as a relative concept. Like we, we met, be in fact, be actually already be a really advanced smart city in like within at a certain compared to another point in time so yeah so going back to that it's not purely about the technology it's also how people interact with each other and how they live their lives that's also a critical part of the smart city definition the cultural human element yeah yeah absolutely yeah i feel like we could definitely talk for a lot longer but we will wrap it up there i just have one last question for both of you how can people connect with you right yeah, so Susanna and I at Herb Smith Freehills, if to anyone out there who has a digital transformation issue or they want to uptake a new piece of tech and they're concerned about the certain legal issues around it, then Digital Law Group at Herb Smith Freehills is available to help you. Just You can just Google search HSF Digital Law Group and there'll be all our contacts over there. Also happy to be connected on LinkedIn. Just type in Raymond Sun and yeah. Cool. We'll put all the links in the show notes so people can click away and find you. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. I am very excited for this episode to come out in early 2022. And yeah, thanks again for joining me on the pod today. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks so much, Zoe, for having us and for giving some airtime to the boring lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're trying to deal with disruption, not sure what technologies to buy, need to facilitate genuine collaboration, then we can help. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community forward slash consulting. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.